Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials Video 50. This is on populations and how populations interact with one another. One of the most famous words in all of biology is called symbiosis. Symbiosis basically means living, living together. Uh, or same life. And so an example of this would be the clownfish in the sea anemone. Clownfish lives in the sea anemone. Uh, sea anemone gives them protection. They have these stinging nidocytes in their tentacles and the clownfish is immune to those so they can live within the anemone. So they get protection. What do they give the anemone? Well, they're gonna feed on little invertebrates that normally might damage the anemone. That'd be one thing. And then they're gonna secrete urea and that urea is gonna be used as nitrogen inside the algae that live in the anemone, which which is another symbiotic relationship. And so that's basically what I'm gonna talk about, relationships between populations. And so these interactions can have effects. Sometimes those effects are good and they're positive, sometimes they're negative, and sometimes they're neutral. And so if we look at all these interactions between populations, those that are positive, those that are neutral, those that are negative, we have all these different types of symbioses. Some that are good, some that are bad, and some that are neither. And so uh, basically we'll go over all the different types. Remember though, that in an ecosystem, these symbioses can help an ecosystem or damage it. And ecosystems are fairly stable, but they're stable because there's constant feedback mechanisms that keep those populations in check. Sometimes those populations aren't in check, and a lot of the time that has to do with changes in their environment. It could be geologic changes, but sometimes it's just gonna be human changes. Example I'll talk about is the introduction of kudzu, which is a plant, into the United States and what that did. And so basically we could summarize all interactions between organisms on a matrix that looks just like this. So this is gonna be population X and population Y, and these are all the different types of interactions that we could have. And so basically I'll go down the list and we'll look at all of those interactions. Uh, know this, that this is just interactions between two types of populations. And ecosystems you could imagine are much more um, intense than that. But let's start with the, the matrix right here. So first of all, um, we've got wolves and lichen. So let's say in an ecosystem, the Yellowstone ecosystem, the zero on this chart means it's a neutral to an individual, the plus means it's good, and the minus means that it's negative. And so I tried to come up with a neutral uh, interaction between the two, and so one where neither are affected by the other. And so this is a type of lichen that grows on a rock. This is a wolf, uh, and wolves don't feed on lichen, and lichen don't require wolves to live, and so we would call this neutralism. In other words, neither of them benefit from this reaction. Now. I would almost argue that there's no such thing as neutralism because maybe uh, lichen are, get their nitrogen from birds that land on the rock and release uh, some kind of uric acid and they can grow with that. And if there's an increase in the wolf population it could lead to a decrease in this bird. You can see how ecosystems are so connected that neutralism is probably just an idea less than actually occurring. Next one is called amensalism. Amensalism occurs when you have one organism that is not um, affected by the other, and another organism that is negatively affected. So this is penicillium. Penicillium is a type of fungus. It's constantly producing a toxin, and that toxin kills bacteria. So in this case, the bacteria is negatively impacted. The penicillin doesn't even know that it's there, and so we would call this a neutral effect, and so we call this a mensalism. A mensalism is when one organism doesn't gain anything from this uh, reaction, but the other one is negatively affected. Next one, we go to commensalism. Commensalism is when one is positively influenced. And so I didn't know this, I learned about this, but the golden jackal, golden jackal, lots of times the males, if they get driven out or individuals as they get driven out, they'll just follow tigers around at a safe distance. And so they'll wait for that tiger to kill something and so they can get some scraps from it. And so in this case, the jackal is not going to affect the tiger, so that would be a neutral reaction, but the jackal just by living around the tiger is getting a positive. And so we would call this a commensalistic relationship where the tiger gets nothing, but the jackal is going to get something good from it. Um, next we'll go to competition. So an example of this could be the lion and the cheetah. They both feed on similar prey. And so uh, if the lion kills more prey, that's gonna be less for the cheetah. And if the cheetah gets less um, 
kills more prey, that's going to impact the lion. And so we call this competition. And so lots of times if a lion moves into an area and they can find cheetah cubs or cheetahs, they'll kill them because they're in direct competition for the same kind of a food source. Next one, we go to mutualism. Mutualism, remember, is going to be when both benefit. And so pollination's example of a mutualistic relationship between insects and flowers. And so what do the flowers get? Well, as an insect lands on a flower and starts to eat the nectar, so it's getting food from the flower and they're attracted to that, it's also going to dust that with pollen. And so as this bee moves away, it's going to move it to a different plant. And so what's the plant getting? It's getting dispersion of its pollen or its sperm to another plant. What's the bee getting? It's getting a constant food supply. And so this is a mutualistic relationship. They both benefit. And if we look through time, evolutionarily, we've had this growth of insects along with the growth of plants. And then finally, we have plus minus. In other words, we have either predation or parasitism. And so right here, we've got a praying mantis that is eating a bumblebee. So that's definitely bad for the bee, but it's definitely good for the praying mantis. And so we would call this predation. Predation is going to be a positive for one, negative for the other. But parasitism is the same thing. And so this would be a cowbird egg. A cowbird is a bird that will lay its bird in other birds' nests. The cowbird will usually hatch first. It will usually gain weight quicker. So the, the, so the parent bird will, can't tell the difference between them. It'll keep feeding the cowbird. Cowbird gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It'll eventually push the other chicks out of the nest. And so that's a type of parasitism. It's good for the cowbird. It's definitely bad for the eggs that are laying right there. And so we call that a plus kind of minus reaction. So those are all the different types. And you should kind of learn these different terms and examples of each of those. Now, ecosystems contain all these interactions between populations, but ecosystems tend to stay the same. And they use feedback mechanisms to do that. And so remember when we learned about feedback mechanisms, this is an example of one. If you're driving down the road and you see the sign going too fast, so you're going to slow down a little bit, and then you're going to slow down too much, and then you're going to speed up, and eventually you hit this checkpoint. This would be a negative feedback loop that you're experiencing, but ecosystems are going to see the same thing. And so wolves were introduced in Yellowstone Park in 1995. Their population took off. Let's find a different color. Took off, and pretty soon there were... Um, over a hundred wolves in this is in northern part of Yellowstone National Park. So what were they feeding on? They were feeding on elk. So if we look at the elk population, elk population was around 16,000. What happened to the elk population? Elk population started to drop off. So now there's not food to eat, and so the wolves are starving. So what's going to happen to them? They're going, their population is going to drop off. They're maybe going to have less pop, pups in their litter, so their population will drop off. What will happen to the elk population? Well, if there's less wolves, then they can have better calves. They can, they're more likely to survive, and so they're going to increase. And so we're going to get this, uh, let's get a color that's right. We're going to get this flunk, fluctuating between the wolves and the elk populations maintaining this kind of static equilibrium or this carrying capacity within it. So it's kind of like a negative feedback loop where the number of elk dictate the number of wolves and the number of wolves dictate the number of elk. So it's a feedback loop and it keeps them it, uh, kind of at a constant at a constant level. Now what's interesting in, when we talk about populations is I'm talking about a population as a whole, but populations are made up of a bunch of individuals. And so this is a cool picture of these birds starting to migrate. And maybe you've seen videos of this, but in any population, a population is made up of a bunch of different individuals, be it in a forest or in this herd or in here, which is a biofilm, which is set up between bacteria. And so all those choices made by individuals create a population that has a specific behavior as well. And so each of the birds in this flock are just trying to stay next to the bird next to them, a safe distance between the two, but we get this living kind of a population, this living system that's constantly in flux. But sometimes populations get out of flux. Sometimes that feedback just doesn't work. And usually that happens when we bring them from somewhere else. And so in 1876, in the Centennial Expedition in Philadelphia, somebody brought this beautiful plant from Japan um, called kudzu. And so kudzu was released to the United States in 1876. Um, it's taken off and it's gone crazy since that. And so much, much of the Southeast is covered in this vine-like uh, plant. 
It was even used in World War II. They released the humans, uh, uh, the American forces brought it to the islands of like Vanuatu just so it would cover up their material, um, just kind of to disguise plants living in, uh, on that area as a camouflage. But once you introduce it into a new ecosystem, there's nothing that's evolved to feed on that kudzu. And as a result, kudzu took off and so its population grew and there was nothing that was stopping it. Until now. Now we have this bug that has made its way here as well. So we, we would call kudzu an invasive species, but now we have this bug that's made it to the United States and it is evolved to feed on kudzu. And so here's Dr. Jeremy Green. I think he works at Clemson, but basically what they're doing is um, looking at the United States uh, for the first time in Georgia. The growth of this bug. Uh, it has since covered South Carolina entirely. It has covered most of North Carolina and now most of Georgia. So this is a kudzu stink bug and we're seeing huge growth of this as it feeds on the kudzu which didn't have a predator before. And so it will eventually maintain some kind of a symbiotic relation between the two and some kind of a homeostasis but when humans make big changes ecosystems are it takes a while for them to actually respond but with humans moving around this planet it's going to be a hard thing for that to stop and so that's populations those are interactions and i hope that's helpful